The following information provides evidence-based guidelines on how to properly perform a rapid sequence intubation or RSI. This video pairs with the attached fluency. The pre-procedure section will only cover exceptions to those mentioned in the direct laryngoscopy video. Please refer to the direct laryngoscopy video for full pre-procedural preparation. Indications for RSI overlap with other intubation methods. Here are some of the most pertinent indications. Specifically, RSI is indicated for patients who are at a very high aspiration risk, are acutely unstable, and are quickly approaching airway compromise. As with indications, many contraindications for RSI overlap with general intubation. However, the use of cricoid pressure is unique to RSI and is not recommended in a patient with a suspected or confirmed C-spine injury as this can be fatal. Also, if cricoid pressure is applied during active vomiting, esophageal rupture may occur. This screen provides acronyms and abbreviations used throughout this video. For the rapid sequence intubation Ms. Maid's preparation, Suction is especially important since RSI candidates are at a very high risk for aspiration. Therefore, thoroughly checking for a fully functioning suction setup is absolutely necessary. Only listening for the sound of suction is not a reliable indicator that it's in working order. Suction should be turned on and ready at the head of the bed. The special step of Ms. Maids serves as a catch-all for any uncategorized necessities. A component very specific and important to RSI is securing an assistant who is trained in the application of cricoid pressure before induction. Moving on to procedure, the provider must maintain universal precautions by wearing a surgical cap, mask, and gloves once hand hygiene has been performed. Once the patient is in the OR, a timeout must be completed and the patient's ID confirmed with at least two identifiers. Appropriate monitors should then be placed on the patient to obtain baseline vitals. If there are no limitations on neck mobility, place the patient into sniffing position by extending the head and flexing the neck. This position aligns the oral, pharyngeal, and laryngeal axes and optimizes glottic visualization. Next, pre-oxygenate the patient by turning the FiO2 to 100% at 10 or more liters per minute for several minutes until the end tidal O2 is 90%. In a true emergency, four vital capacity breaths can substitute. Now perform a final pre-induction assessment of both the patient and their vitals. Confirm that the assistant understands what's expected of them during cricoid pressure application. Be sure to remind the patient while they're falling asleep, they will feel pressure on their neck. Instruct the assistant to apply pressure as anesthetics are given and not to release until successful intubation is confirmed. Administer induction medications quickly, followed by muscle relaxants. Here are some commonly used perioperative meds. This screen displays a list of those frequently used. A lot of content is on the screen, so please feel free to pause and review. With loss of consciousness, instruct the assistant to increase cricoid pressure. Do not mask ventilate. Confirm induction of anesthesia by assessing for apnea and the absence of the eyelash reflex. If it's absent and there's time, tape the eyes to avoid corneal abrasions. With sufficient anesthesia and paralysis, scissor the patient's mouth and insert the blade at the right corner, then sweep the tongue to the left and into the submandibular space. Avoid tissue and teeth damage. If a MAC blade is used, the blade tip will be positioned in the vollecula to indirectly lift the epiglottis. A Miller blade will go beneath the epiglottis and directly lift it. Both blades displace the epiglottis. Once lifted, the glottic opening should be revealed. Look for additional anatomical landmarks and be sure to verbalize them to your preceptor. With the glottic opening identified, carefully place the ET tube and visualize its insertion through the vocal cords. See the video laryngoscope tutorial for a better view of this. After a traumatic introduction of the ETT past the vocal cords, withdraw the stylet and advance the ETT to a proper depth. Here's a list of generic guidelines. The final decision should be based on what's best for the individual patient. Next, inflate the pilot balloon, then connect the endotracheal tube to the circuit. Once that's completed, proceed to confirm proper placement. Confirmation methods are listed here and must be verbalized. They include 
equal and bilateral chest wall movement as well as condensation inside the endotracheal tube. Also, equal and bilateral breath sounds. Lastly, an adequate and consistent end tidal CO2 tracing that's present for greater than three to five breaths is also mandatory. If the intubation was not successful, recognizing the need to forego the attempt and initiate mask ventilation is key. Cricoid pressure is still maintained during this time. After confirming proper endotracheal tube placement, the assistant may now release cricoid pressure. Next, turn on the selected potent inhalation agent, decrease fresh gas flows, choose the proper ventilation mode, and initiate mechanical ventilation. If there was no time to tape the eyes after induction, do so now. Be sure to secure the endotracheal tube at the appropriate depth with tape. Finally, document the procedure.